shape or form, am I worthy to even stand here? Not only get to share the Word of God with you, but um, just to be a part of this great movement. And I feel very humbled for this fact. In my heart of hearts, I've always tried to share the gospel and to share it out of the Word of God. And, you know, lately, more than ever, I feel and I sense that um, we have passed a lot of a lot of marks in time and in history. And um, Satan has a special plan just for us. And he is going to orchestrate it. And he's going to try to move you in every way he can. He's going to try to change what you think and who you follow. And he doesn't really care how he does it. (laughs) He's going to do it. He's going to try. And my heart goes out to the church today. I'm telling you, uh, I don't look forward to what the leaders have to endure from here forward. (laughs) I can honestly say I'm close enough to retirement. You know, that's a blessing, but I'll probably never retire, right, Janie? I'll never retire. That's a joke. But at least, you know, I do have a couple options. (laughs) I'm at that age, and you all know I'm getting older, and I'm old. But um, when it comes to the gospel, we have no options. (laughs) It's a done deal. And we have to sign on to what Christ would have us to do today. Retirement, just rule it out. We're going to go down together. And then we're going to rise up together. Pray for our church. Pray for our leaders. They need your prayers right now more than ever. Aren't you glad God's in charge? Wow. Wow. I wouldn't want to be the judge in this in this uh, war that's going on, and it's a war. And I lo- I'm just looking in my mind, you know, I... I find it a little bit weird in Revelation 21 because, you know, in the end of Revelation, it's all good news, right? Revelation 20, Revelation 21, Revelation 22, it's all good news. But slotted in, written in to the pages of this good news is the solemn warning. And I think really, more than ever, we need to heed this warning today. I read through 21 and I was saying, wow, this is amazing what's going to be. All things made new. Death's gone forever. No more crying, no more sorrow, no more tears. What a day that's going to be when we don't have to wake up with arthritis and limp out of bed. And then look in the mirror, oh, have mercy. Whew. I don't even want to look in the mirror anymore. That's Okay. I'm not talking vanity. I'm just saying my poor wife has to look at me. (laughs) She married a young guy, you know, full of energy, full of, well, I wouldn't say good looks, but I was was okay. (laughs) Now she has to look at me. And I'm like, have mercy. How can this woman love me? And it doesn't matter how bad I look. She still looks at me and says, I love you, honey. I got a good one, didn't I? Woo. But you know, life is reality. <laughs> and right here in verse 27, chapter 21, verse 27, 
through all this good news, happy joy, and all of these things, it says, but there shall be by no means enter it any thing that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in what? The Lamb's book of life. If you look just back a few pages in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables but you be watchful in all things endure afflictions do the work of an evangelist fulfill your ministry christ is saying hang on keep working move ahead no matter how bad it gets no how matter what kind of walls we hit keep moving forward do the work of christ period I see in this message here, God uses the end time satanic deception to publicly expose the unbelief of those who had already rejected the gospel in their hearts. These are church-going, good people, smiles on their face, the best clothes, the best car, the best house, but in their hearts, deep in their hearts, they had rejected the gospel ministry. They were good church-attending Christian people. They believed all the doctrines. Their names were on the books. Up there at the conference level, they were good, outstanding, tithe-paying, good, devoted people. But deep within the recess of their heart, they hadn't fully surrendered to Christ. Dear hearts, there's a battle going on between Christ and Satan, and it's a spiritual battle. Now's not the time to live a lie. In Acts chapter 5, you know, I, I, I gave up trying to give sermons. Writing my own sermon, I gave it up. I quit. I just say, now, Lord, I've been chewing on this for a while. Please help me to put it into words. Lord, you speak, not me. And it seems to be working out better, Will, to do it that way. I don't know. In Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, this is a this 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 particular story in the scriptures just absolutely turns my world upside down. It causes me to do things I've never done, and that's to take a deep look at myself from the inside out. You know this story well. But a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Does that sound great? That's a good, devoted sense of the Adventist Christian. Wouldn't you say amen? Give the Lord his portion, right? But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourselves while it remained? Was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but what? To God. That right there ought to tell you that the Holy Spirit is a, is a, is a person. Amen? That right there alone ought to tell you that because they lied to a person right to his face. They had promised the whole sum of that cell to go to the God's work. You know, now is not the time to lie, to manipulate, to deceive in any way, shape, or form. Everything is God's anyway. Right? It's all His. 
as a church body, maybe, maybe now in earth's history, maybe now today it's time to start selling that stuff that's collecting dust around the house and put it towards the work of God. My wife keeps hammering into my head, Don, we got to pare down. We got to get rid of some things. I'm tired of dusting them. They're just sitting there. Let's get rid of them. Let's bring an antique dealer in here. Let's start selling this stuff. We're not taking it to heaven with us. You see, when divine light is shining into the heart with an unusual clearness and power, habitual selfishness relaxes its grasp, and there is a disposition to give to the cause of God and not hang on to the items of this world. Would you say amen? We can surrender self to Christ. It's His anyway. But none not think that they will be allowed to fulfill the promises then made without a protest on the part of Satan. Even though you have dedicated your heart, your life, and all of your possessions to God, do you think that Satan has given up on you? Satan is not pleased to see the Redeemer's kingdom on earth grow and build to eternity. He's not happy with that. So he's going to try to interfere with whatever plans you might have. So, so my counsel would be submit all your plans to Christ. Hang on because it's going to get rough. In John chapter 3, verse 30. This, this is the essence of the theme of this sermon, that this is what I believe that God wants me to share with you today. There's a statement here, and yes, I know it's a little bit different context, but I want to challenge you today, and I want you to go beyond just the literalness of this statement. I want you to think of the spiritual aspects of this statement in John chapter 3, verse 30. John the Baptist there, being a realist, he says to the, those around him who had built their trust in him, who had looked at him as a prophet of God, someone with the Word of God in his mouth, and they were looking to him for all kinds of things, and John had to put things in perspective in his life. You know what I'm saying? Do you want perspective in life? Do you really want to hang on to what's really important in life? I believe you have to heed this counsel. John looked and he said, He, Jesus, must increase. I must decrease. Amen? It is God who blesses men with things. It is He that is able to give to us the things we need in order to advance His cause. That should be the focus. He must increase. We must decrease. Now John was talking about his public ministry, of course, and all the things that Jesus would bring to their side and their understanding. But I believe it goes even further than that. I think John, within his own heart, within his own ministry, came to recognize something very important and I think all of us ought to accept and understand, and that is that he isn't worthy even to tie the sandals of Jesus' feet. <laughs> they shouldn't be looking to him. They shouldn't be looking to the world for their completion, for their wholeness, for their maturity. They should look to Christ. I believe personally in my heart of hearts. This is, this is my new, uh, well, it's not my new, well, yeah, it is. It's a new re realization, and that is this very important thing. Whenever I get into a conversation, whenever I act, whenever whatever I do, I, I want to, I want Christ to increase and me to decrease. Now, now you might think that that's easy, dear hearts. You might think that's something easy to do, 
But I'm telling you, it is very difficult in every conversation, in every act, every day, every pursuit in life, in everything you do, if you have Christ increase and you decrease, there's going to be a change go on in your life and it's going to be a massive change. And you're going to see things from a totally different perspective. And I believe John had it right, right here. John knew the truth. And the truth was that Christ must increase in our lives and we, our wills, must decrease. That's hard. I, 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 I just want to challenge you today. Dear hearts, I want to challenge you. When you, before you even walk out of these doors, before you even get up out of your pew, I want you to say one simple thing to you in your mind. I must decrease. Jesus must increase in everything I do and say and every act of my will. And dear hearts, it's going to be challenging, but it's going to be rewarding. It is so hard not to resort to self. It is a lot harder to trust in Christ fully with everything. You see, it's selfishness that hardens the heart of a, of a, of a Christian. It's self-centeredness that keeps us from doing the will of God. And it's by submitting to Christ and allowing Him to be superior in our life. That is the only way that we truly understand the gospel and are, are willing and able to commit and to be loyal to the God of heaven. It was that way with Ananias and Sapphira. They thought, well, you know, the sell of this property, we had promised it to the Holy Spirit, but he won't miss it. So we'll take just a little bit, we'll give it to him, and then we'll take the rest. Simple plan, right? I mean, it seems, does it seem righteous? I guess if you introduce evil human nature, it seems righteous to do it that way. But they had promised the full amount to God. It was his anyway. And yes, this is a harsh story. Yes, this is a revelation that we don't all like. It seems disgusting that they would be judged so harshly. But dear hearts, it was a critical time of earth's history in their life. The early church was trying to grow. It needed every fabric of ounce of energy and support that it could handle. It was a critical time in their life. Do you, do you hear me? Does that sound familiar? Are we living on the edge or the precipice of eternity? Is everything we do and say and every act, is it important today as it was back there in the early first century movement? Is it seem similar to you or is it just me? It seems a little bit too familiar to me that this situation in, in Acts in the first century which seems so unfair if we were to judge it from our human standpoint. But in order to lie and manipulate God, you know, our lives could be a living lie. Now, I'm not pointing any fingers. I'm talking right here. This is convicting to me even more so. I'm supposed to be a leader. I'm supposed to be an example. And this is truly convicting. Is my life a lie? Do I come to church on Sabbath all dressed up, looking good and feeling good, and then I check out and leave and I forget everything that I've learned at church and the worship that I've brought to God? Is it tainted with self? Because, dear hearts, selfishness is what hardens the heart. Somebody asked me that question one time. They said, Pastor Don, how could God harden Pharaoh's heart? I found the answer. It's selfishness. That's what hardens the heart from God being able to work through the individual. 
And, and I think that's why amidst all this good news, no more pain, no more suffering, a new Jerusalem, <laughs> death gone forever, and, and, it's, and, it's, and it's, it's coming to its crescendo. It's the end of the story. It's all good news. And then he gets to the final of two verses. But by there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. It's a warning. Don't get comfortable. Don't become indifferent sitting in the pews waiting for Jesus to do something or to come in the clouds of glory. Act now. The cause of Christ has an importance today. Maybe we don't see the results or the finishing up of what Christ is going to do, but today is the day to act. Today is the day to engage not other people, but ourselves in asking the question, what should I do, Lord? What should I do with my life? And the answer should come back by the Holy Spirit, it should be, He must increase, you must decrease. That's the answer to a selfish heart. Christ must increase in your life, and you must decrease. I must decrease. Trust me, I've been trying it on. <laughs> It's not easy. Because you know why? I'll just be real with you here. You have to stop yourself right there in the midst of whatever's going on. You got to stop yourself. And you have to say, okay, Lord, I must decrease. You must increase. How should I answer this question? You must increase. I must decrease. I have to have more of you. They need to see less of me. That is difficult because it interrupts self. And self is what hardens the heart. So we must be willing to trust Christ because in Revelation 21, verse 27, it says, by no way are lying lips going to go into the kingdom of heaven. It's an abomination to God. If you are pretending to be a good Seventh-day Adventist Christian and your life does not proclaim in and out of church that you are a follower of Jesus and that He has increased and you have decreased, your life, in essence, is like similar to Ananias and Sapphira. I don't want to be Ananias. In all of my being... You know, I was thinking the other day, and it hit me. Um, <laughs> why don't people name their sons Judas anymore? Did you ever run into a Judas? <laughs> did, did you ever run into a Judas? I have. You have? There's not many people that, you, that call their sons Judas. I mean, you know, we're trying to pick our grandson's name. And <laughs> my daughter and I are um, kind of going through through the ritual. I'm suggesting names. My wife helps me with that. And uh, there was one I really liked. Uh, what was it, Luann? Lewis? Yeah, Park Parker Adam rolls. So his, his name would be Par, because I like golf. But she didn't like that. Adam loved it. She didn't like it. But what's the one that you, you, Finley Lewis. I like that because my middle name is Lewis. So I, I've been trying to push a little bit, you know, self was coming out. How about Lewis? No, dad, that's not going to happen. I said, okay, more of Christ, less of me, right? <laughs> that's hard. That's hard to do that. It's hard to tell yourself, self, get down. Self, get in place. Self, you know your place. And it's at the foot of the cross. It's not elevating itself to a high place, looking in the mirror and thinking I'm somebody or I'm important or I'm special. 
All of those things are true in the eyes of Christ because He died for you. But those things are not very comfortable today as we enter into the end of time and we are getting closer and closer to the precipice of eternity. We have to believe that if we are going to make it, we have to increase Christ and lessen ourselves. I can't say that enough. Truthfully, and I'm not talking about work salvation. I hate works. I don't, I have a hard time with people who think works is a way to get to heaven. I just have a hard time with that because that, it puts such a disgusting tone on the cross and on Christ and his unselfish sacrifice it it just tears it to pieces and i i just i have a problem with it but i do believe that christ wants us to submit our wills to him and to surrender everything we have to him i come to recognize this punishment that they endured it was a physical punishment they died instantly the husband and the wife but then they The worst thing is they lost eternal life. You know, Jesus said, don't worry about the one who can take your life. Worry about the one who can take your eternity from you, right? And the only way that we can do that is by trusting in Him, releasing our will to Him, and to allow self to be hammered down and allow Christ to increase in our life. That's the only hope we have. And I believe that we're getting closer and closer to the end of time, and soon we're going to have to make some tough decisions. And Satan has a plan just for Seventh-day Adventist Christians, trust me. He's got a plan for us. And he wants to get you off course, and he wants to get you on his plan. I don't want to march by Satan's plan, do you? (laughs) Do you want to give your will to God and do you want Him to become predominant in your life and you become secondary? Do you you really want that in your life? Show me with a raise of hands. Do you really want Christ to come into your life and to take, as you surrender, to take dominion of your life that yourself can be tamped down and you can, for once in your life and forever, Be willing to say, Lord, you must increase. I must decrease. Let us pray, Father, thank you for this wonderful opportunity. As we, our hearts still beat, as we still have the breath of life within our bodies, Lord, I pray and I plead that you will honor those hands, the, 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 the answer to that question and that your will be done in our lives, that our lives will be truly fruitful, that we will look at things a whole different way, that we can trust you with the future, which is tomorrow, which is the rest of today. Lord, please, I beg of you, let Christ increase in my life Lord help self to decrease thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus name